Around the turn of the 20th century, in order to save the dying heliocentric model from the conclusive experiments of Airy, Mickelson, Morley, Gale, Sagnac, Cantor, Nordmeyer, and others, Albert Einstein created his special theory of relativity, a brilliant revision of heliocentrism, which in one philosophical swoop banished the universal ether from scientific study, replacing it with a form of relativism, which allowed for heliocentrism and geocentrism to hold equal merit. If there is no absolute etheric medium within which all things exist, then hypothetically one can postulate complete relativism with regard to the movement of two objects, such as the Earth and Sun. At the time, the Michelson-Morley and Michelson-Gale experiments had already long measured and proven the existence of the ether, but the church of heliocentrism was not to be deterred. Einstein never tried to refute the experiments scientifically, choosing instead to object philosophically with his notion of absolute relativity, claiming that all uniform motion is relative and there exists no absolute state of rest anywhere in the universe. Nowadays, just like the theory of heliocentrism, Einstein's theory of relativity is accepted worldwide as gospel truth, even though he himself admitted geocentrism is equally justifiable. Albert Einstein said, the struggle so violent in the early days of science between the views of Ptolemy and Copernicus would be quite meaningless. Either coordinate system could be used with equal justification. The two sentences, the sun is at rest and the earth moves, or the sun moves and the earth is at rest, would simply mean two different conventions concerning two different coordinate systems. George Ellis said, people need to be aware that there is a range of models that could explain the observations. For instance, I can construct you a spherically symmetrical universe with Earth at its center, and you cannot disprove it based on observations. You can only exclude it on philosophical grounds. In my view, there is absolutely nothing wrong in that. What I want to bring into the open is the fact that we are using philosophical criteria in choosing our models. A lot of cosmology tries to hide that. Einstein's necessary modification to the heliocentric theory ultimately resulted in transforming it into the acentric theory of the universe, because the sun was no longer the center of anything, and all motion was only relative. Acentrists soon began postulating that not only is the earth spinning a thousand miles per hour, and revolving 67,000 miles per hour around the sun, but the earth, sun, an entire solar system as a whole are simultaneously rotating around the Milky Way galaxy at 500,000 miles per hour. Furthermore, the entire galaxy with the Earth, Sun, and entire solar system are also simultaneously shooting 670 million miles per hour through the universe away from a Big Bang explosion at the beginning of time. E. Eschini said, the theory of the three, now four, motions of the earth and subsequent relativity is the result of trying to cover up one lie by another. They say that as we whirl in London at the rate of nearly 11 miles a minute, we are shooting into space around the sun at nearly 20 miles a second, and the sun itself moves around a point in space at the immense speed of 150 million miles in a year, pulling our poor earth with him at the added speed, the distance that separates us from the sun, and in this maddening whirlwind of motions, they try to apply Euclid's spherical trigonometry to locate distances, which data was intended by Euclid to determine fixed points only, with the result that they have brought out wild calculations which have been fostered dogmatically on a gullible world, but are about as infallible as the utterances of Borgia. When Einstein first introduced his theory of relativity to the world, he often used the analogy of a wagon rolling along the street as an illustration. What we mean by relative motion, he stated in a Princeton University lecture, in a general sense, is perfectly plain to everyone. If we think of a wagon moving along a street, we know that it is possible to speak of the wagon at rest and the street in motion, just as well as it is to speak of the wagon in motion and the street at rest. That, however, is a very special part of the ideas involved in the principle of relativity. Gerard Hickson says, That would be amusing if we read it in a comic paper, but when Professor Einstein says it in a lecture at Princeton University, we are expected not to laugh. That is the only difference. 
It is silly, but I may not dismiss the matter with that remark, and so I will answer quite seriously that it is only possible for me to speak of the street moving while the wagon remains still, and to believe it, when I cast away all the experience of a lifetime, and am no longer able to understand the evidence of my senses, which is insanity. Such self-deception as this is not reasoning, it is the negation of reason, which is the faculty of forming correct conclusions from things observed, judged by the light of experience. It is unworthy of our intelligence and a waste of our greatest gift, but that introduction serves very well to illustrate the kind of illusion that lies at the root of relativity. When he suggested that the street might be moving while the wagon with its wheels revolving was standing still, he was asking us to imagine that in a similar manner the earth we stand upon might be moving while the stars that pass in the night stand still. It is a case of appeal where Einstein appeals in the name of a convicted Copernican astronomy against the judgment of Michelson, Morley, Nordemeyer, physics, fact, experience, observation, and reason. On the surface, relativity may seem plausible enough, especially when presented by a charismatic character of Einstein's caliber, but is it really so simple and straightforward? In fact, Einstein's theory of relativity is so complicated and convoluted that when it first came to the public's attention, it was said that there were probably less than a dozen people on Earth capable of understanding it. After Einstein presented his theory to the Royal Astronomical Society, philanthropist Eugene Higgins offered a prize of $5,000 for the best explanation of relativity in essay form, describing it so the general public could understand what it was all about. Prize winner Mr. L. Bolton himself admitted that even when stated in its simplest form, it remains a tough proposition. Along with Einstein's denial of the ether and anything absolute, except the absoluteness of relativity, he had to create a litany of new terms and ideas, each depending upon another and contributing to support the whole. For example, Einstein claimed that there was no ether, that time is a fourth spatial dimension, that infinity and eternity do not exist, and that light is a material thing. This meant that time must be added to the three dimensions of length, breadth, and thickness, that space be renamed a continuum, and points in the space-time continuum be renamed to events. Gerard Hickson said, What we have always known as a point in the terms of Euclid, Einstein calls an event. But if words have any meaning, a point and an event are two totally different things. For a point is a mark, a spot, or place, and is only concerned in the consideration of material things, while an event is an occurrence, it is something that happens. There is as much difference between them as there is between the sentence, this is a barrel of apples, and these apples came from New Zealand. While claiming time as a fourth dimension, Einstein explains that by dimension we must understand merely one of four independent quantities which locate an event in space. This is to imply that the other three dimensions which are in common use are independent quantities, which is not the case, for length, breadth, and thickness are essentially found in combination. They coexist in each and every physical thing so that they are related, hence they are not independent quantities. On the contrary, time is an independent quantity. It is independent of any one or all the three proportions of material things. It is not in any way related, and therefore cannot be used as a fourth dimension. Einstein's theory of relativity claims that light is a material thing which therefore has weight and is subject to gravity. This idea meant starlight could now bend under its own weight and curve its path based on the distance and mass of objects along with its trajectory, which allowed heliocentrists like Einstein to claim stars are in reality not where they appear to be, and that with his new geometry, the stars must be moved to much farther away than previously assumed. Einstein's Law of the Constancy of the Velocity of Light states that light always travels at the same speed, 186,414 miles per second, or 671,900,400 miles per hour. But Einstein also claims that gravity causes light to bend towards massive objects along its trajectory. If a ray of light can be said to bend, curve, or deviate from its course due to the gravitational pull of masses in its path, it must by necessity accelerate when approaching and decelerate when receding from these things. 
However, if light can bend under its own weight, or under the law of gravitation as Einstein claims it does, then it is not, and cannot be, absolute. Gerard Hickson says, Strangely enough, while Einstein claims that everything is in motion and nothing is stable, he allows one thing, and one thing only, to remain outside the realm of relativity, independent of everything else. He claims that the velocity of light is constant under all circumstances, and therefore is absolute. This is a blunder of the first magnitude, but I do not imagine that he fell into it through an oversight, for it is quite evident that he was driven into this false position. He was compelled to say that the velocity of light is constant, because if he did not, his new geometry would be useless. We are told that light is a material thing, and that a beam of light is deflected from a straight line by the gravitation of any and everything that lies near its course as it passes within their sphere of influence. And we are further assured that light always maintains a uniform speed of 186,414 miles per second. We have, however, to remind Professor Einstein that this was determined as the result of experiments by the physicists Fizeau, Foucault, Cornu, Michelson, and Newcomb, all of which experiments were conducted within the Earth's atmosphere, on terra firma. In all these experiments, a ray of light was reflected between two mirrors several miles apart, so that it had to pass to and fro, always through the atmosphere, and it is not to be supposed that light or anything else can travel at the same speed through the air as it would through the vacuum Einstein supposes space to be. Let us reverse this in order to realize it better. It is not to be supposed that any material thing travels at no greater speed through a vacuum than it does through air, which has a certain amount of density or opacity. If anything does not distinguish the difference between air and a vacuum, then it is not a material thing. It cannot be matter. On the other hand, anything that is matter must, of necessity, make such a distinction, and in that case, its velocity cannot be constant. Conventional wisdom for Einstein's theory was that light was not a material thing, that it discharged in a straight line in every direction from the source, that it could not be influenced by gravity, could not bend, curve, or be deflected from its course by anything. As Lord Kelvin said, light diverges from a luminous center outwards in all directions. Its velocity may be affected according to the density of the medium through which it passes, but this fact simply proves Einstein's law of the constancy of the velocity of light is incorrect. Gerard Hickson said, the length of the course used by Newcomb in the final determination of the velocity of light was 7.44242 kilometers. If the ray of light had deviated by a hair's breadth from an absolutely straight line, it never could have passed through the interstices between the very fine teeth of his revolving wheel, or returned precisely to the appointed spot on his sending and receiving mirrors, which were 3.72121 kilometers apart. The fact that the ray of light did pass from mirror to mirror, and through the wheel, proves that it maintained a straight line, hence it is certain that it was not deflected from its course by the gravitation of the earth between the two mirrors, wherefore it is obvious that it was not affected by gravitation. So we find that the very experiments by which the accepted 186,414 miles per second as the velocity of light was measured, experiments which were carried out with the utmost painstaking and minute attention to detail, prove that a ray of light is not influenced by the gravitation of the earth in the slightest degree. Therefore, if those experiments were good enough to warrant all the world in accepting the velocity of light, they may be equally well adduced as proof that a ray of light does not bend by its own weight, and that light is not affected by gravitation. Relativity is clever, but it belongs to the same category as Newton's law of gravitation and the kant herschel laplace nebular hypothesis, in as far as it is a superfine effort of the imagination seeking to maintain an impossible theory of the universe in defiance of every fact against it. And Robert Sugenis said, As for Einstein, if you want to believe that lengths shrink when an object moves, time changes in the process, and its mass increases, just so you can explain the anomalies of Michelson's experiment, that's your privilege but I'd just as soon answer it by saying that mass, time, and length stay the same, and the Earth isn't moving, and I'm just as scientific as you for saying so.